I do have a closing song today. Yeah, oh, awesome. All right, thank you, Lloyd and Ashley. Thank you for singing, Ashley. You guys are quite the duo. I'm so blessed to sit where I sit in church and hear all of your beautiful voices, and you should be very blessed that I don't sit back there and you guys sit up here to hear my joyful noise. I think if John ever wants to play a joke on me, he could leave the mic on when I uh, start singing. Church will clear out real quick. So we are in week 14 of our series, History, Exploring Life's Foundations in Genesis. And uh, I'm getting a little sad. Abraham, the life of Abraham in our study is kind of coming to a close. This week will be the last true week on Abraham. And next week, the bishop will be here. The week after that, we'll be talking about Lot, uh, still obviously associated with Abraham since Lot is his nephew. But after that, we'll be moving on to Isaac. So we'll be in the book of Genesis probably till around June, July, something like that. There's, there's a lot, <laughs> so we're not going to rush through it by any means. But week 14 today, so sermon title is called, Is There Anything Too Hard for the Lord? Is There Anything Too Hard for the Lord? So our main text today, Genesis chapter 18, and our key verses will be in verses 1 through 15. So just to recap, again, I love to do this every week. The book of Genesis, it's a historical narrative which means that it is literal history. It is not mythical. It's not figurative. It's not allegorical. Genesis doesn't stutter. Let's just put it that way. The literal meaning of the word Genesis is origin, its source, or the beginning. So through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Genesis was written by Moses, and he wrote the five, uh, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You can sing the song in your head. And it's quoted, Genesis is, more than any other book in the Bible. Genesis is quoted more than any other book in the Bible. So in our series, we see we've transitioned to the life of Abraham. A little bit about Abraham for background purposes. He was born around 2166 BC in the bustling, industrious city of Ur of the Chaldees. It's on the Persian Gulf. So it probably was very pretty at that time. God changed his name from Abram, which means high father, to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. So we see in our series uh, last week that his name was changed to Abraham. And then the importance of his life cannot be underestimated. He's mentioned some 308 times in the Bible, 234 in the Old Testament, 74 in the New. And the first 11 chapters of Genesis covers a whopping 2,000-ish years the last 39 chapters chronicling Abraham and his seed span just 350 years. So that'll give you uh, an, why, also why it's going to take us till about June or July to get through the rest of Genesis. God gives more intricate details about Abraham and his seed than the creation account. Pretty amazing. So it's important. And Abraham begins what's called the patriarchal stage in the Bible. And as we continue, we'll see who those other patriarchs are. So he, he starts it. So this week, we're going to look at some main themes from chapter 18 in Genesis, and we're going to see what the life of Abraham teaches us about the impact of God's amazing grace in our lives. So in the life of Abraham, we've seen a lot of ups and downs, and that should be a picture to us because our lives are filled with ups and downs and disappointments and blowing it, you know, and we see God restoring Abraham, giving him a new name and I think a lot of times in Scripture, we like to put superhero capes on, on some of these individuals. And the only superhero cape we can put on is Jesus. So Jesus is the only perfect one. Uh, a lot of times we like to glorify individuals in the Scriptures, but God is very gracious in letting us see behind the curtain, especially in Abraham. He's obviously a big deal. Uh, we see in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews, I mean, he's commended. Uh, so obviously the Lord worked through him in great, great ways. His uh, descendants are like the stars in the sky, but it's important to see where they fell short, where these patriarchs fell short especially, and learn from that and apply it to our lives. So we see at this point in Abraham's life, God, God's amazing grace is shining through. So a couple themes we're going to look at today. Theme one, God's grace transforms our character. God's grace transforms our character. Theme two, God's grace transforms our confidence Theme three, God's grace transforms our perspective. And then the fourth theme, we're going to apply everything. It's the so what or the application. So main point for today is this. Grace is how God grows us. Grace is how God grows us. 
So open up your scriptures to Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and we're going to read together. If you don't have your Bible, just listen and uh, soak it all in. All right. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. This is talking about Abraham. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. So Abraham went quickly to the tent to Sarah and said, quick. Three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have the pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, And Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy, Lord. And Lord, just speak through me this morning to your people. And Lord, open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's look at some main themes from Genesis chapter 18. And again, we're going to see what the life of Abraham teaches us about the impact of God's amazing grace in our lives. Theme one, God's grace transforms our character. God's grace transforms our character. So the timeline we see here in Genesis chapter 18 occurred only a very short time after Genesis 17. In fact, it was roughly no more than three months. So to recap, we see in Genesis chapter 16, Abraham was at his lowest point. He was out of fellowship with both God and his family. A little over 10 years of spiritual silence and wandering is what Abraham dealt with. God spoke to Abraham and introduced one of his most intimate yet powerful names, El Shaddai. Again, that happened about 10 years after, a period of 10 years of wandering, silence. And it's often in those dark times in our lives that the Lord brings us through and he is with us even when we can't hear him. Shaddai in Hebrew means bosom of the nursing mother, and El means strong one, so El Shaddai. That's a very intimate name that the Lord gave to Abraham here. And thereafter, the Lord invited Abraham to walk with him, so that solidifies the intimacy here. God also changed his name, as we saw, from Abram, which means high father, to Abraham, father of a multitude of many nations. And again, note, God didn't change his name after Isaac was born. (laughs) That's the cool part here. Abraham had to wait longer, even after his name was changed. It was God's grace that paved the way for Abraham and his family to be given a much-needed fresh start, and that's what we see here. So we see the manifestation of the fresh start in the following ways. First, we see Abraham was personally visited, visited by Jesus along with two angels. This is one of the coolest portions in all of Scripture. Check this out. Let's reread chapter 18, verses 1 through 2. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. So here's a question. How do we know that this is actually Jesus appearing to Abraham here in the Old Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the Hebrew meaning uh, for Lord here, capital L-O-R-D in verse 1 means Yahweh or Jehovah. So anytime you see capital L-O-R-D in your scriptures, it means Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. If your Bible doesn't have it, 
the reason why modern day translations do is so you can distinguish between Yahweh and Adonai, which is capital L, lowercase o-r-d. So Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D, is God's proper name for himself, illustrating his deity. So we know this had to be God himself appearing, right? Okay, so John 1.18 says this, No one has ever seen God, the Father, but the one and only Son, capital S, who is himself God and is at the Father's uh, side, has made him known. And then Colossians 1.15 says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Okay, so therefore, if God appeared to Abraham, and the text clearly says that he did, it must have been the eternal second person, capital P person, of the Godhead appearing. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So, make sense? Additionally, skipping ahead really quickly, and we'll come back to verses 12 and 13 in a second, but skip ahead a little bit. You see Sarah is laughing to herself. Very important detail in Scripture. She's laughing to herself regarding Jesus saying she'll give birth to Abraham's child, which will, would be Isaac. Again, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, then said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? So Jesus knew she laughed to herself. This is only possible with God. Only God knows our thoughts. So therefore, it had to be Jesus. See? Theologically speaking, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus is something called a Christophany. And this means Jesus appearing before he was born in the flesh. So a Christophany is a churchy kind of word here, but they're actually quite common throughout the Old Testament. And basically, again, all it means is a pre-incarnate or pre-born experience uh, for Jesus. Remember, Jesus has always existed. It's not like he came into existence when he was born with Joseph and Mary. Jesus has always existed. He was involved in the creation of the world. And even before that, he's always been. He's outside of time and space. So here are a few other examples in Scripture, other than what we're talking about here in Genesis 18, where uh, Jesus appeared in the Old Testament. So example number one, we saw it actually a few messages ago. Genesis 16, Jesus appeared to Hagar. So the angel of the Lord, it says in Scripture again, that Lord part is capital L-O-R-D. So that means Yahweh in Hebrew here too. So Jesus here not only confront, uh, comforts Hagar, but he promises that he will increase her descendants. Again, only God could do that. If this was a normal angel, it wouldn't make any sense. Angels don't have the power to do that. But what brings it all together in Hagar's response is, in Genesis 16, 13, she said to the angel of the Lord, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one, capital O on one, the one who sees me. So clearly from her statement, Hagar had an encounter with God in physical form. Since Jesus is God in physical form, this can be referred to as a Christophany, Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. Here's a second example, Judges 6. Jesus appeared to Gideon. In verses 12 and 14 of Judges 6, the angel of the Lord, again, capital L-O-R-D, interacts directly with Gideon. These verses describe that the angel of the Lord physically appeared to Gideon. He sat down and spoke to him, engaging in an actual conversation. Again, since this was Yahweh or Jehovah appearing, it had to be Jesus. And example number three, Daniel 3. This is probably my favorite one. Jesus appeared to Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Nebedigo in the fire. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but putting your kids to bed, you could say, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed you go. Yeah, there's a dad joke. But I need the drums over here. So Daniel chapter 3, 24 through 25 says this. Then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They, cert uh, they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Hmm. And then in verse 28 we read, which solidifies this, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any other god except their own god. So Nebuchadnezzar, his life was changed by this, basically, and saw Jesus in the fire. Pretty amazing. 
So the second way Abraham's fresh start was manifested here in Genesis 18, we see real consistent spiritual fruit in Abraham's life. So so here's a quick summary of Abraham's past up to this point. Abraham went from half obedience by staying in Haran instead of going into the promised land. He went from giving into the world's temptations by going down to Egypt in a famine to lying to Pharaoh about Sarah. Remember, say you're my sister to protect himself and had his testimony ruined. In fact, Pharaoh himself called out Abraham. He was Abram at that point. Then we see the giving into impatience and having a child, which was Ishmael with his maid Hagar, who he picked up in Egypt, by the way, when he wasn't supposed to be there. And then to now, we see the transformation. So let's reread verses 2 through 7 again in chapter 18. So he, speaking of Abraham, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, If I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. All right, so if you're not careful, you could easily breeze past some main details here. Look at Abraham's character now. Verse 2, we see Abraham running with excitement, enthusiasm, and with hospitality to meet the men, the, the angels, one Jesus, two angels. Then he got on the ground and bowed. So that's very humble behavior. Verse 4 through 5, Abraham and Sarah prepared a lavish meal for them. Typically, the servants would do all of this, but Abraham and Sarah were directly involved here. That's a big deal too. Verse 3 and 5, Abraham called himself the Lord's servant twice. And in verse 7, the biggest indicator here, Abraham gave the Lord his very best offering, a tender and good calf. This detail must not be overlooked. It's a big deal in the Old Testament particularly. So let's look at another example in Scripture regarding the difference between the offerings of a couple other guys, Cain and Abel, back in Genesis 4. And we, we uh, went over this message weeks and weeks ago. Not specifically their offerings, but in this area in Genesis. So let, let's look, at the, uh, look back at this and illustrate the heart behind Abraham's offering. We can tell the difference between Cain, Cain and Abel. So Genesis chapter 4 details the following. Abel was a shepherd, and his offering to the Lord was the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. So Abraham used a calf, Abel used a lamb, doesn't matter. It's, the point is it's the best portion, the very best portion. So see the similarity there? Cain was a farmer, and his offering was some of his crops. Some. Doesn't indicate if they were his best, just some of his crops. And Genesis 4, 4 through 5 says this, And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So notice the stark difference between the character of Cain and Abel. This kind of helps us understand what, what, why it was such a big deal what Abraham was bringing. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this, For the Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It was all about the heart behind the offering that mattered. And remember, Abraham did not get there overnight. There was a lot of stumbles, a lot of heartache. We even see, going back to Cain and Abel, Hebrews 11.4 even talks about it. It confirms as much that the offering was a big deal. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. And again, remember, the Lord didn't need the offering. It was the heart behind the offering and the motivation behind the offering. And Abel was willing to give his first fruits just like Abraham was. And it was by grace through faith. So our main point, grace, is how God grows us. So theme two, God's grace transforms our confidence. God's grace transforms our confidence. So in verse 10, God repeated his promise of an heir to Isaac to Abraham, but this time he sets a date. Did you see it? Let's reread verses 10 through 13 in chapter 18. 
The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. So a year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. And this next part is very key. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord, talking about Abraham, that's lowercase l-o-r-d, Abraham is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? So we see the context of the original Hebrew in verse 12 shows Sarah laughing in fascination, not really if, but how God was going to give her an Abraham a son at such an old age. So by all outward appearances, there really was good reason for Sarah to laugh at the literal fulfillment of this promise. Note, verse 11, again, the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. It doesn't take a, a, a scientist, a doctor, to know what this means. She'd stopped menstruating. She had gone through menopause. Sarah literally could not have kids anymore. Although having a child of their own was what Sarah and Abraham wanted most all their lives, they found it hard to believe God's promise when he said he would grant it to them. When we fully rest in God's grace, we no longer need to worry about the how. So the how. How are you going to do this, Lord? One theologian said this, It is strangely characteristic of us to believe God's promise for a long, long time, enduring through much discouragement along the way, until the promise is almost there, and then we find doubt. We are grateful that He is greater than our doubts. Amen? So I'm not very gifted <clears throat> when it comes to fixing cars, and this goes back to when I was a kid. I never really learned about it much, so naturally, I was hesitant to dive right in because a car is a very expensive thing to mess up. It really is. And that's changed a bit over the last few years, as I've grown and matured and I've been learning a bit more of how to take care of cars and my confidence has grown, thank goodness for YouTube, <laughs> and you can actually figure out how to do things. Kind of cool. So I'm taking more risks, trying to fix things myself, again, to a point. I'm not going to go sit there and try to change my oil. My, my uh, father-in-law taught me, tried to teach me how to do it and I was like, after the first step, I was lost. So I'm not going to try to strip the, uh, strip the oil pan or anything like that. So even though I, didn't know, I don't know how it's going to turn out a lot of times when I take on these projects, uh, that's the big thing. But that's not the point. It's, can I pay attention to a video? Can I follow directions? That's really more of it. But last summer, I was taking our old van out of the garage, and I didn't realize that our little Corolla was next to me, and I backed up, and I absolutely obliterated the mirror. <laughs> it just came off, cracked, all kinds of stuff. So instantly, I felt panic considering the how. Oh no, how much is this going to cost, first of all? How in the world is this going to get fixed? This car is not drivable without a side mirror. So I, as I was contemplating the how, I actually saw, I saw my reflection in the mirror's cracked glass. And then this really strange thought popped into my head as I looked at myself. I wonder if I can fix this. I wonder if I can. And I thought immediately, maybe there's a YouTube video to help me. So I pondered, I looked on YouTube, and to my surprise, I found one exactly for my car. And uh, it was a great instructional video. And I decided, I think I'm going to try this. Let's do this thing. So I had no idea how it was going to turn out. But nevertheless, I proceeded to pull off the door panel. I disconnected the wires, exactly how the video instructed in the mirror. Um, then I was able to get information to order a new mirror and even offer, uh, order matching spray paint, car spray paint. And the new mirror arrived with the paint a couple days later. So first I painted the mirror, just like the video kind of said, to match the existing one. I let it dry overnight. Then the next day, I pulled the YouTube video back up and installed the mirror step by step. So I had to watch the video probably five, six, seven, eight times. That's okay. Then I put the door panel back on. And I really, I was amazed. I didn't know exactly how I was going to do it. But by giving it a try, instead of being so quick to write myself off, as I'd done many times in the past with car stuff, it was mission accomplished. And I saved myself hundreds of dollars. That was the cool part. But here are some great verses about growing in God's grace and how that changes our confidence. Even when we don't know the how sometimes. Sometimes. 
or even the why. But Jeremiah 17, 7, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. Philippians 1, 6, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that one. Ephesians 3.12, In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Hebrews 13.6, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Psalm 27.3, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. And on and on and on. That's only a few verses. But again, main point, grace is how God grows us. So theme three, God's grace transforms our perspective. God's grace transforms our perspective. Let's reread verses 14 and 15 in chapter 18 again. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Wow. (laughs) At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. She was afraid she got caught. (laughs) He said, no, but you did laugh. So verse 14, one of the most precious promises in all of Scripture. What's deemed impossible for man is possible with God. I mean, literally, this humanly was not possible for Sarah to have children. Again, we don't have to be doctors or scientists or anything else, for that matter, to determine that. The simple yet profound concept that every believer must recognize about grace is this. I can't but you can, Lord. I can't, but you can. Grasping God's grace, it changes our entire perspective on life. Mark 8, verses 31 through 34, gives perhaps one of the most powerful illustrations of this concept in all the Bible. And it is one of the most awe-inspiring verses that leaves you saying, wow! I mean, poor Peter, man. He really, he gets such a bad rap. But can you see yourself as Peter? I mean, I can. I think we all can. So let, let me read this. If you want to look along, you can keep your thumb back in Genesis 18. But Mark 8, 31 through 34, if not, just listen. And he, Jesus, began to teach them, talking about his disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, very clearly, and said it many times before this too, by the way. And Peter took him aside. He said, he, be, he began to rebuke Jesus, the scripture says. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, Oof. for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Could you imagine? Oh my, my heart would have sunk. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus teaching his disciples and taught them this regularly, that he's going to be crucified. He's going to die for the sins of the world. He's going to rise after three days. And Peter, man, bless his heart, he takes him aside and rebukes Jesus and says, no, this is not going to go down. There's no way I'm going to let them do this to you. No way possibly this is going to happen. Jesus' response, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Could you just put yourself in that picture? I mean, how many moments have, have that, has that been us? And the Lord is like, man, your mind is totally not even near my will. <laughs> it's satanic, in fact, right now. Like, whoa, you have to deny yourself. All right, boy, come on. <laughs> it's understandably easy for Christ followers to come so accustomed to the way the world thinks, so the things of man that Jesus is telling Peter, that we begin observing, reasoning, and responding to life the way the world does. As the church, we excuse it, kind of like in Peter's situation, as long as we do it in Jesus' name, of course, but it's so easy to lose our perspective, especially our biblical perspective. Peter shows us here how challenging it could be in life to see things through Jesus' perspective instead of the world's perspective. One author said this, worldly preconditioning sways believers all too easily into evaluating life through the lens of worldly thinking, worldly values, worldly perspectives, 
of who God is and His Word are, and His Holy Word are. Unfortunately, this often comes naturally and comfortably to us. This unwittingly results in confusing, then conflicting biblical with personal convictions, kind of like we see with Peter here, which invariably gravitates the believer away from a pure, undivided devotion to the Lordship of Christ and the authoritative sufficiency of the Scripture. So perhaps as believers, this is why our measure of faith so often depends on how much the odds look in our favor at the moment. If the picture looks bleak, we lose heart. If we have to wait, we lose heart. If God says no, we lose heart. If God's plan doesn't match up with our convictions, like in the example of Peter and we see in Sarah here, we lose heart. Like Peter, as we see with Sarah in our own lives, we easily lose perspective. In 1969, one of the most famous upsets in sports history occurred. The New York Jets, and I can't believe I'm saying Super Bowl and Jets in the same sentence. That's how long it's been. It's been a long time. The Jets, they were 19-point underdogs to the mighty Baltimore Colts prior to Super Bowl III. And this is a confusing part. If you're not a football fan, you'll see today the Baltimore Ravens are playing for a spot in the Super Bowl. The Baltimore Colts moved to Indianapolis back in 1984. Then the Cleveland Browns moved to Baltimore to become the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, yeah, don't even. It's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> no more moves. So the Jets were 19-point underdogs to the Colts before Super Bowl III. The odds were not in the Jets' favor. No one gave them a chance. And at this time, the NFL merged with the AFL, which is how we got the Super Bowl in the first place, and now it's all one big NFL. But at this time, the Colts were in the NFL and the Jets were in the AFL, and they met with the right to call themselves Super Bowl champions. The NFL was deemed to be far superior to the AFL at this time, and the results showed in that. The first two Super Bowls, the NFL's Green Bay Packers crushed the AFL's Kansas City Chiefs both times. They didn't have Patrick Mahomes then, the Chiefs. That's why they didn't win. But there, you got a, a, a sermon on the history of American football right there in the midst of the big sermon. So as if the Jets' task wasn't daunting enough, their young quarterback, handsome, at the, uh, by the name of Joe Namath, Broadway Joe, said this several days before the game, we're going to win the game, I guarantee it. And the headlines exploded. While everyone saw it as a joke, the Jets didn't. The Jets were in the Super Bowl not just to make a close game out of it, they were in it to win it. And it's as if the Jets knew something no one else did. Their perspective was completely different from everyone else's. No one thought the Jets' offense, led by a young Joe Namath, could even compete with the legendary Colts' defense. But Namath, he was so sure of it, and he said it as much again before the game. He said, we're a better team than Baltimore, he proclaimed. After the Jets pulled off one of the most stunning upsets in sports history, they beat the Colts 16-7, and the Colts didn't even score until the end. One journalist asked Namath if he regretted how much he trash-talked before the game. He said, rhetorically, do I regret what I said before the game? No, I meant every word of it. I never thought there was any question. I only meant it as a statement of fact. Well, as Christians, imagine what our perspective in life would look like if we remove the walls, we remove the barriers that hinder our faith in the Lord. Let's reflect on that right now. Is would you say your faith is more shaped by the world's view of the Bible or the Bible's view of the Bible? Submitting to be led by God's grace changes everything. It changes our, changes our whole perspective. God's grace is how God grows us. So fourth theme, let's wrap a bow on this thing. The so what, the application. Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, he addresses something called sanctification, which means change or a metamorphosis in the daily life of a believer. And this process happens by God's grace through faith. What is sanctification, actually? It's a churchy word, again, so let's break it down. The work of the Holy Spirit in us. Sanctification is the act whereby which God works out Christ's righteousness in the believer's life. Sanctification happens moment by moment as the believer surrenders one's life to the Lord. Sanctification is a process. 
It's a gradual and continuous process. It hurts. It's painful. Sanctification delivers from the control and the power of sin. Sanctification must be repeated because, again, it's an ongoing process. It's continuous. Sanctification is the work and miracle of a lifetime. And sanctification gives you the character of Christ. Romans 6, 3-4 says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death, meaning Jesus's? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that, underline this next part, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Paul, he's talking about the moment we trusted Jesus for our salvation, we were placed into Christ, united with Him, joined to Him eternally by the Holy Spirit. This is the most beautiful reality that an unrighteous sinner is made righteous and joined to God's righteousness, righteous Son by faith alone. This is only made possible by superabounding grace. And this leads Paul to a second point. And this is where most professing Christ followers fail to reach their full maturity and growth. If believers were baptized into Christ and joined to Him completely, then we were also unified with His death. And because we are unified with His death, then we are united with His burial. And because we are united with His death and burial, we are joined to and united with His resurrection. And therefore, we can and should walk in newness of life. That is the logical sequence of thought here. So through the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants you and me to utilize His resurrection power to live a life that glorifies Him, not ourselves. It's a life that glorifies Him. We are to live out of our position and identity in Christ. And that is practical sanctification or growth. It's made possible entirely by grace. So picture this scene presented by a Christian author. I love this. A man is suddenly approached by a ferocious bear while on a walk through the woods. The man runs into a shack. Though the, uh, the, though the structure is securely supported by thick timbers, he is unaware of the fact that he thinks the grizzly will burst forth through at any moment. This man was safe the moment he fled into the shack. However, since he was ignorant of that fact, he trembled in terror. The poor man could have died of a fear-induced heart attack even though he was secure. The premise is this, if we do not understand who we are in Christ and our security in Him, we will act accordingly. We are safe in His arms. Another pastor summarized it this way. I think this one's even better. Day one, I went for a walk down a street. I fell into a hole. I didn't see it. It took me a long time to get out. <laughs> it's not my fault. Day two, I went for a walk down the same street. I fell in the same hole. It took me a long time to get out. Why did I do that? Day three, I went for a walk down the same street. I fell in the same hole. I got out quickly. Hmm, it's my fault. Day four, I went for a walk down the same street. I saw the hole. I walked around it. <laughs> Day five, I went for a walk down a different street. Amen. That's the process of growing in God's grace. And as we see in Scripture, and we've talked about this from the, this pulpit before, but in Romans chapter 12, Paul talks about it and uses the word metamorphosis. And funny thing happens when that worm goes to a butterfly in that process. If you, trying to be a hero, interrupt that process with that worm struggling to become a butterfly, going through a long process you're going to mess that butterfly. It's not even going to be a worm or a butter. It's something bizarre that you, the butterfly won't fly, <laughs> in essence. You have to let that struggle take place, even when you're so tempted to rush in, and, and it goes to its fullest completeness, and what happens? That butterfly bursts out. Butterflies are some of the most gorgeous creatures on earth. Are they not? They all have individual patterns. They're just so gorgeous. But that thing was a worm before. How many of you guys like worms? They're yucky, right? But would you let a worm crawl on your finger? But a butterfly, you'd be like, ooh, yeah, it's beautiful. But that's us. Before Christ, we're like that dirty worm, right? We're gross. 
And then that struggle's taking place. That metamorphosis starts happening. And again, it's by God's grace. But when you're going down the street and you keep tripping down the same crack, falling in the same hole, and you don't decide to walk around that hole and that crack or go to another street, then what are you going to get? You're going to be that worm. The Lord wants us to be a beautiful butterfly and grow and fly and thrive. But again, remember, it's not for our glory. It's not so we can, as a butterfly, be like, man, I'm so pretty. I love this flying thing. It's to glorify Him. And that's where, as believers, we get caught up because it becomes about us. It's not about us. It's all about Him. In our sanctification, our Heavenly Father desires that we spend our lives manifesting Christ's resurrection life and power. Not about how powerful we are, but by manifesting Christ's resurrection life and power. Living out of a place of freedom from sin's control. And man, could you imagine your life if everything, all the walls were torn down and you gave all of it to the Lord on a daily basis? That's naturally going to result in happiness and joy. Of course, those are byproducts though. God's grace is how God grows us. That's our main point. So as we close, let's just summarize what we learned today. We saw what the life of Abraham taught us about the impact of God's amazing grace in our lives. And again, remember, Abraham was that worm struggling. He wasn't perfect. But at this point, you see the resurrection fruit in his life. Living out of that, out of that power that you see God's presence being with him. Jesus came to visit Abraham. I think it it changed some things for him. So theme one, God's grace transforms our character. We saw that Abraham, he went from half obedience at Haran instead of entering all the way through the promised land, from giving into the world's temptations by going down to Egypt in the famine, from lying to Pharaoh about Sarah, saying that, say you're my sister. That is not romantic. Valentine's Day is coming up. Do not say your wife is your sister. We saw that he did that, though, to protect himself, and his testimony got destroyed. Pharaoh called him out. Then he gave in to impatience, having Ishmael with Hagar, and then to now. We see Abraham's fresh start was manifested in Genesis 18. He was personally visited by Jesus along with two angels. We also saw the development of spiritual fruit in his life. The main aspect was that Abraham gave the Lord his very best offering, a tender and good calf, And again, it wasn't so much about the offering itself, it was his heart behind it. He was ready at this point. Before, it might have been something different in his heart, but now he meant it. And this part here in Scripture must not be overlooked. And we see 1 Samuel 16, 7. We saw a beautiful verse here. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And then theme two, we saw God's grace transforms our confidence. The context of the original Hebrew here in verse 12, it showed Sarah laughing in fascination, not if, but how God was going to give her and Abraham a son at such an old age. And again, by outward appearances, uh, by physical, there was a really good reason for Sarah to be laughing at the literal fulfillment of this promise. She couldn't have kids anymore. But when we fully rest in God's grace, we no longer need to worry about the how. He's got that. Theme three, God's grace we saw transforms our perspective. Verse 14 in Genesis 18, one of the most famous and precious verses in all the Bible. What's deemed impossible with man is possible with God. And this was the answer to Sarah's dilemma. The simple yet profound concept that every believer must realize about grace is this. I can't, but you can, Lord. Grasping God's grace changes our entire perspective on life. And then as we applied it, we saw Romans 6. The Apostle Paul is addressing sanctification here, which means change or metamorphosis in the daily life of a believer becoming more like Jesus. This process happens by God's grace through faith. However, this is where many professing Christ followers fail to reach their full maturity, as we saw. But through the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants you and me to utilize his resurrection power and live a life that glorifies him. If we are to live out of our position and identity in Christ, we see practical sanctification can occur. And it's made possible, again, entirely by grace. Our hearts have to be willing 
but the Lord is the one that does it. If we think we're the one that does it and we try and try and try and try, it doesn't mean give, giving you your full effort. It, you're, you're supposed to, but the Lord is the one that does it because grace is how God grows us. That's our main point. Let's pray and then uh, we'll have Lloyd come up and do our final song. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is the one that changes us. We can't take credit for us. But Lord, you call us to work in conjunction with you and be willing. So Lord, help us to have a willing heart to put aside the things of the world. Lord, to put aside all the cares and worries that we put on our shoulders, Lord. And Lord, to take up, Lord, just the cross, Lord, and daily taking it up and denying what we want for everything, Lord. And instead, Lord, your will be done rather than our will. So, Lord, we just thank you for your love and mercy. And thank you, Lord, that your grace is amazing. In Jesus' name, amen.